My patrons ask and I answer. An armor tier list based on, you know, my opinions. Which, as the writer in my fantasy heroine short series would say, is apparently what the people want. This video is sponsored by NordVPN, which I also have opinions about, and I will be sharing those later, while outside, in a forest, in a costume, because of course. Our armour tiers are, I'd wear it. It looks good and comfortable, and if I had to wear it in a theatre production or a film, I would not object to doing that. Pretty good. It's mostly fine, but it's just not quite there for me for whatever reason. Not actually armour. This is the tier which is basically NA not applicable. This isn't armour per se, it's not actually meant to be protective, but I have been asked to review it and so this is the tier I'm gonna put it in. I'll give you my opinion on it, just not on its combat effectiveness, because that's not what it's for. Moving on down we have Could Be Worse. Looks good but wouldn't function, or would function okay but just kinda looks bad. And everyone's favourite, just stab me now. It's meant to be armour, it's meant to be protective, but it would either be an active hindrance or completely useless, or it's just so ugly that I can't look past it. First up we have Pike Trickfoot from Legend of Vox Machina, and you will be vastly unsurprised to know that I've never watched that. I believe that this is her official concept art, but I have no idea what these things are made of. I assume the light grey is metal. Is the dark grey metal? This suggests yes. I mean, as is often the case in fiction, helmets are apparently for losers, but it does have decent coverage otherwise, and aesthetically it looks, you know, nice. It does look like something you could wear for most of the day and not collapse from exhaustion, so two thumbs up for that and overall a pretty good. This is Eirik Bernison from the His Dark Materials Golden Compass movie, I think. I never actually watched The Golden Compass, shock, but I did read the trilogy of books at least once. There were other series in my teenage years which I reread multiple times, but this one just didn't grab me the same way. But I did vaguely remember that bear armour is made of something specific, so I looked it up and it's made of sky iron, which is to say from metal from meteorites, which I guess is why they gave it this kind of rainbow effect. Either that or he gets even more special armour because he's king of the bears, I am not sure. The armoured bears in the books are supposed to be amazing metalsmiths, so I must assume that all of this pitting is intentional. Either that or it's just been really beaten up. But it does look like Eirik is wearing the golden rainbow bones of some enormous monster and I'm kind of here for that. Shape-wise, it covers most of the head. I love that it's shaped to cover the front, back and sides, but leaves absolute freedom of movement for the legs. And because bears are covered in fur and really tough skin, I'm guessing they don't need much in the way of underlayers anyway. I mean, I am not a giant sapient bear, but if I were, I think I'd wear it. On to the first of the Dragon Age Inquisition characters we're covering today, Cassandra Pendergast. Oh, Cassandra. Somebody tried. Alright, this is gonna take a minute, let's break this down. One, you always get points for full body coverage. There's no helmet as far as I can tell from the Bioware website, but again we sort of are used to this, are we not? But it's the other details that just make this weird. Two details in particular, and if they do have a lore explanation, please do let me know. Alright, we've got spolders, which is what we're calling shoulder armour, which doesn't cover the armpit or upper chest. That would be a pauldron. We've got mail, which is a little oddly shaped. So the sleeves of the male seem to just be in a sort of leaf shape over the top of her upper arm, which is weird because that area is already mostly covered by the spoulders. But the male doesn't continue around the back of her arm to give her any kind of armpit protection, and that's a little odd. Pretty sure there's a fairly big blood-carrying thing here. Now I'm assuming that she has a full male shirt under here and this sort of tabard thing on the top is just for decoration, and that's fine. But what's with the studs? Because I'm not sure they do anything, and if they're there for decoration, they're not really working for me because the placement of them is a little haphazard. I'm not sure if the skirty bit of the tabard is sort of quilted or if it's meant to be more like brigandine, but either way, those little studs actually seem to be doing something, so that's fine. And overall on the top part, it's okay. I mean, some effort has clearly been made, there are some bits that could be improved, but overall, you know, it could be worse. But then we get to the boots, and I'm so sorry, Cassandra, I really am. What is with that big hunk of metal? Right where your foot bends. And the poline, that's the knee armour, why is it half covered by your boot? Is that not just gonna make it more difficult to bend your knee? The polyne is also kind of pointy at the top, which might get caught on things, but you know, I, I understand aesthetics, so sure, whatever, but I'm not sure you can bend your knee properly, and you definitely can't flex your foot properly. Like, you thought I was just mad about high heels. No, 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 I can get annoyed at impractical footwear of all varieties. If you have some kind of historical justification for it, like, this is the footwear that everyone wears in everyday life, and sometimes they get jumped by bandits, then okay, I guess, but no, this 
this is not it. Just stab me now. I'm sorry, Cassandra. You just can't move about with those things on your feet. You just, it's not going to happen. It's no good you looking protective if you can't actually get where you need to go and do what you need to do. Speaking of protection while doing what you want to do, because my segues are impeccable, let no one tell you otherwise, this video is sponsored by NordVPN. And so to entice you into watching the sponsor read, I'm going outside in armor. Also, there will be D&D jokes. It seemed like a bit of a no-brainer to talk about a VPN in an armor video because it protects you just while you're online. But to be honest, I'm working on my similes because I think maybe it's actually more like a hologram. Don't worry, I'm going to return to this thought in a minute. Nord routes all of your internet activity through an encrypted private network, which means that you can trip merrily through the wilds of the internet without having to worry about your IP address being exposed, which is a distinct advantage when the internet is full of weirdos who might want to steal your credit card information or find out where you live. Maybe it's like the D&D simulacrum spell. Because all your internet traffic is encrypted, it also means that your internet service provider won't know what site that you're on and won't artificially throttle you if you're on streaming sites that they don't like, for example. Or maybe it's more like Project Image? And you can watch your favourite shows even when you're travelling on an adventure in different countries simply by setting the country to the one that you're usually in. Or possibly the mislead spell? coupled with mage hand. It's also, and I say this as someone who has a lot of items on my to-do list, reassuringly easy to use. I set it up one time and now it just auto-connects every time I turn on the computer. And it's so quick that I mostly don't even notice that it's on anymore. You know, if I were a wizard wearing this getup, by definition it would be not actually armor. You can try Nord Risk Free with their 30-day money-back guarantee. And you can go to nordvpn.com slash up to learn more about this exclusive offer. And if you have a better simile or D&D spell for what a VPN does, do leave it in the comments. It has started to rain. Ah. Oh, my next patron request was whatever comes up when you google mouse guard armor. So here are some of those things. This one, not actually armor. I mean, it's really stinking cute, but it's just that they have weapons. They are armed, they're not armored. Not actually armor, but oh, look at them. This is a two for one, and on the left, I would say pretty good. Now you'd think I'd give something which has this much coverage the highest rating, but they are mice, and I'm concerned about how thin you can make metal. As with the one on the right, I would say could be worse. I mean, it does have these unfortunate gaps in it. I would feel a lot better if they overlap. But it does seem to be made up from scraps, and so you feel more forgiving of something which seems to be haphazardly put together. All right, Stormtrooper armor. There are two problems that I can see with Stormtrooper armor. One, that it seems to have wildly varying capabilities, and two, space weapons seem to outdo space armor by quite a lot. Canonically, and by canonically I mean on the internet and also in some of the visual guides, the idea is that Stormtroopers don't actually die, generally speaking, from blaster bolts. They fall over because of a concussive shockwave or something, but they can just get up again because the under layer of the armor means that it dissipates the deadliness. I guess. I believe you can see this explicitly in Star Wars Rebels, but who's to say it's not happening elsewhere too. Now, I ended up falling down the most Reddit related of rabbit holes to try and figure out what the official female Stormtrooper armor looked like, and the answer seems to be it depends. Some of them have no codpiece. One of them has no codpiece and is real shiny because major character. Some of them are basically identical. But all of them look terrifying, and while Luke canonically cannot see a thing in this helmet, that's probably because he hasn't bothered to turn on the heads-up display, because he doesn't know how. I mean, if I were some kind of space fascist trying to make a point about conformity and military might and intimidatingness, and also I didn't want to immediately die if someone shot me with a blaster, I think I'd wear it as long as it fit me. Now, just to forestall the comments, which some people are already making, because this seems to confuse some people, the clone troopers in the prequels are indeed all clones, and thus all male, because they're all clones of this one guy. In the original trilogy, they're not clones, and there are, I think, some female ones, but you don't hear any speak in the movies. In the sequel trilogy, they are not clones, there are male and female stormtroopers, you see and hear both kinds, and I think they were stolen as children to become soldiers or something. I'm not entirely clear on that. Our final set for the day is Cullen, hopefully from Dragon Age Inquisition, but mostly people don't actually send links to the exact armor set they want reviewed, they just tell me the name of it, which occasionally leads to confusion. So hopefully this is the right one. Cullen has the distinct advantage that right off the bat he has a helmet. I know that shouldn't weigh so heavily, but honestly, unless you're in a theater setting where you really don't want a full face helmet, because even if you bellowed you would be unlikely to be heard, I like a helmet even if it seems kind of impractical, because you know what? 
at least they tried. I don't really know what's going on underneath all of this fur, to be honest, but I'm going to be charitable and assume that there is some more metal related protection on the back of his head. But let's be clear about what this is because I think that's important. He's not in full plate and that's okay. He's got a helmet, he's got a cuirass, or cuirass, you can pronounce it either way, I don't care, other people might, but I don't care. He's got van braces and spolders on and this other stuff looks to be leather, I guess. Not necessarily very thick, super protective leather, but I guess some of it could be. Leather by itself is not much protection against sharp weapons unless it is hardened and quite thick, but oh well. And unlike a lot of female characters, his entire body is covered. There are no weird skin gaps. So that plus helmet is a pretty good right off the bat, honestly. I'm assuming from his clothes that he is somewhere that's temperate to cool. He has covered the metal on his torso with fabric, which will help with temperature regulation regardless. But he's also got a big fancy fur collar and a big fancy lion's mane on his helmet neither of which would be fun if it were in any way warm. Still, assuming that he's not fighting in the desert, he's probably fine. The only thing that gives me pause, aside from the fact that his sword seems to be floating in midair, but whatever, is this sticky out bit on his upper arm. Because if it were up on his shoulder, I've definitely seen examples of that. So I asked Zach and he said it's called a hot piece and they're there to deflect blows away from the armpit, neck and head. Here's a very fancy example and here's a small early example. But this thing does not do that because it's, it's too far down. It needs to be further up on his shoulder. Overall, two thumbs up for the helmet and very practical design, but aesthetically, I'm just not feeling it. And so that coupled with the weird shoulder piece will go for pretty good. It's a high pretty good. I'd wear it if I had to, but I don't think I'd choose to. If you enjoyed this armor review, we have many more. So I will put a link to the playlist of all of the costume related videos next to my face. Don't forget to go to NordVPN for an exclusive offer. I'll see you next time.